Okay, so, uh, wait, um, Ingo, in the last talk, mentioned when we were evaluating blockchain, the first question is, is blockchain even appropriate for what we're doing? And that's why I'm here tonight, is actually find out whether what I'm working on, is it even, is blockchain relevant to it or not? I'm here to ask that help from you. So, I've been working on a solution to the problem of misinformation for many years now. And, um, and I want to walk you through that. And so this, this talk is going to break into basically three parts. And the first two are the main ones. The first thing I want to do is talk about the problems that we are having by the problem of fake news. And can you give a bit of a warning to everyone here that may be working on it? And everyone here, when you are uh, reading about attempts to solve it, Facebook and Google, some of those red flags will get for you. Because as far as I can tell, no one else is pointing out these concerns the way that I have been um, interacting with them. So I really want to go into that. And then I'm going to talk to you about what I've been working on for a few years um, and how I've changed from what I was doing back in 2012 to now and how we are launching that, which will lead into the last bit, which is before I get started on that project, how does the blockchain potentially make it brilliant or is it completely inappropriate? And we'll leave that to the question. So, before I begin, uh, I, a little bit about me, just so that you know where I'm coming from in this whole process. Because I have a very weird background. I did a double degree, science, philosophy, history, philosophy of science. Then I started an affiliate marketing website, and then I did a range of startups on one mapping outdoor recreational activities like rock climbing and canyoning and that sort of stuff. And last year I made a biotech company and went from San Francisco into Indie Bio and I'm a generalist, a futurist, I'm a technical optimist, and as you'll see as I go through this, all this sort of weird background all comes together into this issue. Um, and you'll see, particularly the philosophy of history and philosophy of science comes together. Now, when everyone tries to solve this problem of fake news, back off. Who is, so when we try to solve fake news, who here thinks that we want to have a central authority that declares the truth dogmatically? And who, who thinks B? Um, I was going to ask this, because hands up. Who wants A? Everyone wants A. The dogmatic declaration of truth. No one wants that, right? That's obviously the poor option. I mean, James. AI, not humans. AI, I will bring that up. I will cover that. Um, arguably, that is, that is a great point. Maybe we get some perfect bene um, benefactor. Benevolent, thank you. AI that is perfect at determining truth and falsity, and they can just guarantee the truth. I will cover that. So obviously, we want some sort of system that improves critical thinking in some some um, systematic way, and let them make up their own mind. So why is everyone doing the opposite? Every attempt so far basically comes down to versions of we're going to figure out what's fake news and flag it for you. Google's um, looking at things to identify misinformation and punish it in their algorithm. Facebook wants to uh, allow people to flag potentially false information and then flag it publicly. Everyone else that sort of looks at it going, you're not doing enough. They, they do come up with the same thing. Develop browser plugins that will add little tags in the corner that say that it's false. Now, all of these, none of them are censoring anything, none of them are deleting information. But when you flag misinformation, what's the intent? The ultimate outcome ends up being the same. It's, this is bad information, you shouldn't be sharing, you shouldn't believe it. If you're punching it in the algorithm in Google, you're pushing it down the search results, you are hiding the information, which basically comes, it, it trends towards a form of censorship and deleting information. So, well, I think this is you're flagging misinformation out of existence is what we're trying to do, one way or the other. And this is the slide where I'm gonna go through all of the problems <coughs> with this sort of approach and work through them systematically, but very, as quickly as I can. So, because of a limited time, I'm going to go through this very quickly. And so there's going to be big questions at the end because these are complex issues. But the first one's obvious. Who do you trust with this power? Do you trust Google to decide what's true and false? Do you trust Facebook to decide? Do you trust the UN, the <coughs> government? There's no one you really want to trust with this sort of power to make information go away. Particularly when you're looking at the internet where it's all information. So you're like, if Fox News decides that they're going to run this story and not that story, that's fine. You don't have to watch Fox News. You can go to The Guardian or the Huffington Post, or you choose your media outlets. Because no media outlet controls all information. But the internet has become a repository for basically 
all information now. And Facebook and Google aren't the internet, but they are our interface to the internet. Practically speaking, you know, speak to, to the less tech savvy friends that you have, and they think of Facebook as the internet. And they say, I read it on Facebook. It won't be on Facebook, it'll be someone shared an article from something, but to them, the interface is basically the thing. So when we start asking Facebook or Google to flag incorrect information out of existence, we are basically deleting the access to that information from the public's ability. They can't access it, practically speaking. They can, but they won't. So who do you trust with that sort of power? Um, and then, if let's say Facebook does this thoroughly, and they start going, anything that's not true, we're not going to allow on our medium. Now, the thing with the nth degree is that you can sort of, um, you know, I'm taking it right to the end. Let's say they decide Christianity, Islam, and Judaism can't all be true. One of them must be wrong. In fact, you know what? Let's say they're all wrong. Nothing, anyone publishes anything on Facebook that says God is real, we will filter it out. Now, if they did that, then every religious person would be outraged, and they would rightly stop using Facebook and go to another social media website that allows them to do that. So what we end up with is a yeah, ideological echo chambers on a global scale. Like, you think there's echo chambers now? There aren't. On Facebook, you can see your friends that disagree with you, and you can interact. But imagine if every, you have like four different social media networks, and each social media network is divided along ideological lines because of which media outlet decided what was true and what was false. So, any attempt to start deciding what's true and false will split up population because everyone believes crazy things. And they believe it, they're not doing it just to like troll, they actually believe things that aren't true. So, you will divide the, um, the world. Uh, so the second big issue is how to guarantee accuracy. Um, for a start, it's philosophically impossible to say what is true and false. We've been working on this for thousands of years. We can't say it with certainty. So, how does any system do that? All we're going to do is approximate it. And, and you know, we can get pretty close, but we will never actually have it. So what we have here is a system where people are trying to get towards this impossibility, and the first step, they start flagging this information, it creates a false sense of security. People start going, oh, that's okay. Real information being removed from my newsfeed, I can start believing it. And it's imperfect, so people will start believing things that aren't true because it made it through the filter. So it creates a negative consequence, even though it's intending to be good. And that leads to the ultimate problem, the artificial intelligence that is benevolent and perfect. We were at a system where Facebook and Google and everyone uses this AI and no misinformation gets through. The next generation that grows up in that world will never have any reason to doubt anything that they come across. We are training a generation of people to be passive believers in everything they read. And all you need is one person to come out and put a lie in there and take control of the population. So this goes back to the, the question. Um, do we want a dogmatic authority that tells you the truth or critical thinkers? We need critical thinkers. The only way to solve fake news is for the people to be critical thinkers. As a matter of fact, and so this goes into the philosophy industry of philosophy. We've only ever come up with two ways to approximate knowledge and truth. First is the Socratic method. It comes down to designed to sting people into realizing their own ignorance. True knowledge gained only by constantly questioning assumptions that underlie what we do. To achieve truth is to engage in a permanent state of critical thinking. Socrates walked around to people that claimed to know things and said, how do you know them? What do you mean by that? What does that mean? Just, it was a pain in the ass and that's why they kill you. But it worked. Freud <laughs> made the point. Like, people that claim to know things don't really know it. They think they know it. They think for a range of reasons and just, that's the best thing they've ever hoped for. So, you know, he's, he's famous, he's the wisest man because he knows that he knows nothing. I appear to be wiser than, than he because I do not fancy I know what I don't know. I can't teach anybody anything I can only make them think. And then, more recently, Sir Karl Popper, who was knighted for this very observation, um, came up with the principle of falsification, which is the ideal underlying science, which is it's not a scientific theory unless you can falsify it. So you come up with a theory, you come up with, you explain the theory, and you go, this is true unless this is observed, this is observed, this is observed. 
you lay out exactly what would prove it wrong. And then you go about trying to prove it wrong. So science never gives us the answer. It just works on showing us what's not the, what is not the answer. It's all it ever does. So every genuine test of a theory is an attempt to falsify and refute it. And no matter how many instances of wax ones we may have observed, this does not justify the conclusion that all swans are white. You have your theory, you go and you try and disprove, try and find a black swan. Don't find another hundred black swans to prove nothing. So, on being less wrong. When you understand knowledge and truth in this way, your objective is just, yeah, there's no claims of truth in this system. No one ever has the truth and we don't need to know it. Knowing it is a mistake. I need to know. And there's no need to trust anyone when you're going through this. You don't need to trust any authority. Your objective is actually to challenge all authority, to challenge everything. Uh, and so that's where the emphasis is. I.e., consider claims critically, critical thinking, discard that which is incorrect, and be less wrong. This is the answer to this information. So, that's the first section. Hopefully, anyone that's working on the problem of fake news will take that into stride because. Everyone's trying to flag this information. And everyone will keep doing it, no matter how many times I say this. But I think every step of that process will make the world worse than it currently is, as well intentioned as it is. So, here's my backstory of how I got to this point. 2012, a friend shared, uh, 2011, my friend shared an earlier precursor for this article. I read it, understood it, went, okay, this is crap. But I didn't want to, I wanted to show the friend it was crap, but I didn't want to write out an article myself. So I tried to find, someone else would already critique it. This already existed, but I couldn't find it. This also existed shortly thereafter. But no matter how much I searched, so I'm pretty good with the net, um, I couldn't find them. Because I didn't know who wrote them, I didn't know what websites posted them, I didn't know what their titles were. So I had a situation where I had an article in front of me that I knew was wrong, I had friends that believed it, and I needed to convince them that they shouldn't believe this, but I couldn't find some of the team the time to show why. So I'm looking at this problem going, isn't it really obvious what I need here? I just, just show me all the people that have critiqued this. We have an internet full of information, and I know that someone's written about this and said why it's wrong, because it's wrong. And if you read something that's wrong, you just go, ah, yeah. you know that XKCD comic? Can't get a bit now, someone's wrong on the internet. We are motivated to critique shit, <laughs> particularly when it's this crap. And I'm not going, why I'm going to find it. All I wanted was a button that I could press that would give me a list of every page that's ever critiqued that page. It seems really obvious to me. So I did nothing about it for six months trying to find someone who had done it. And no one had done it. So we built a browser extension called Rebutter. Um, it just tells you when the page that you're viewing has been rebutted. Really simple idea. Um, we then added a Twitter reply widget so you can reply to people sharing this information. A hack in the URL. You can add rebuttal.com slash the beginning of any URL and it tells you whether there are rebuttals or not. Made a Reddit reply bot, which scans Reddit posts, and if there's a link in it that's being corrected, then everyone can tell them about it. And we had a lot of success. We had 20,000 um, active plugin users at one point, over 20,000 rebuttals in the system. Um, but the problem is, is there's no business here. This doesn't make money. And the whole startup thing of you know giving people what they want, people don't want this. People don't want to install something that tells them what they believe is wrong. Even though the other doesn't do that, we don't say what you believe is wrong, or we don't say that someone else says that what you believe is wrong. But as long as it is an opt-in system, it's never going to achieve what it needs to achieve. So in the years that I was working on it, and um, in the years that I wasn't working on it in between, uh, it became really clear to me that what we needed to do was focus on the data we collected and make that accessible to the people that need to use it. And the people that need to use it are Facebook, Google, and so forth. We don't need to start with them, they'll be the end goals. But we need the people that control the information, the website owners and the, the plugins that are used. So at the core of, of this project was this database. And it's this simple. This URL rebuts that URL. That's all it takes. Um, we identify whether they're like directly rebutting or just generally. We also handle voting voting types. But that simple core to this, this simple database, allows us to do say this. On the top left there, you've got 
a website, a web page, a URL, and these are all the other URLs that are connected to that one. So we've got a list of every page that connects the first page. Now, how do you sort that list? Well, yeah, there's many different ways to do it, but an obvious one is allowing people to vote. Now, when someone votes on this list, they're not voting to this page saying it's the best page on this topic. They're not voting saying this one's right and that one's wrong. The votes are purely Basically, that vote saying, yeah, this is a good critique of that page. And the objective is to sort this list of pages to figure out which one's the best critique. It's not about truth, it's not about trust, it's not about anything other than getting the best critique of the list. Because at the end of the day, that's what you want. You want the strongest argument. So, most people know what straw in an argument is, maybe. So, a straw in an argument is when you're arguing against someone. But instead of arguing, arguing against what they actually believe, you make up a weak version of their argument and then you knock that down. It's a real problem with discussions because they're, it's irrelevant knocking down something that someone doesn't believe. This process sort of takes that out. It allows you to artificially steal man. Is that a term I've heard of? I think it was the principle of charity is a philosophical term. We want to get the strongest argument at the top so that the people that wrote the original article, the people that believe that, can respond to our best argument, not to something that someone said that's crap. We want the strongest argument. Because then, that's a page two, that can be critiques and rebuttals, and now we've got a list of rebuttals to that page, and they, the people that believe this can vote amongst, anyone can vote amongst their pages to get the best critique, and so on. And so now we have two content that exists on the web that is connected semantically, but not necessarily connected through links, like if you're just viewing the first page, it doesn't tell you about any of these other pages. But the database stores the connections, and now we've organized the web so that from any given page, you have full access to the best debate of this issue that the internet has available. That's what, um, that's the core of all work on Ramada, and that's the, the concept that I'm bringing to the Socratic web. So, when um, the latter half of 2016, when fake news finally became this big issue, people suddenly realized that misinformation <laughs> causes problems. It could result in nuclear war, if you're the wrong president. Um, climate change, these things have consequences. And when people believe misinformation, they vote and act in stupid ways. So the world started caring. And for me, like having worked for Rebar, I was like, all we need is critiques. Something like that. Non invasive, doesn't pop up, doesn't say it's wrong. <coughs> You can pop up on every single link, click on it, get access to the rebuttals. Facebook can even like that. What was quite obvious to you though is what we've done with rebuttal wasn't set up to allow them that confidence. We're not going to work with a little startup that hasn't proven the ability to guarantee the quality of the rebuttals. So the idea behind the Socratic Web is to launch the non profit open access, open source consortium that is built with the collaboration of these companies to get their input to meet their needs so they feel confident to implement this system themselves. We build the database for their needs, and then that database would just sit in the center, this public good doing its own thing. Facebook would query the API from the database. They develop their own user interface. They put it however it suits them. They test it. Twitter could do the same thing. Google could do it in their search results in Chrome, Mozilla, Microsoft. Everyone could just query the database and use it however they want. Um, and then on the other end, Snopes pull back. Anyone that writes critiques, if you knew that the critiques you wrote would immediately be attached to the thing that you're critiquing everywhere on the web, there's no question that you would submit to the database the second you wrote it. It's the best traffic you'll ever get. So, um, and then you've got another third party, like Rebutter itself would just become like another third party that accesses the database and allows them to vote on the links or whatever. So, what I have here is a practical solution. And when I say solution, it doesn't solve the issue. Fake news was still there, misinformation was still there, people still believe it. But it's the beginning of a foundation, it's part of the immune system. It's that prompt, it's like, are you sure? But not just are you sure about this misinformation, it's are you sure about everything? Question it, think about it. And if you're not sure, read the rebuttal, you might learn something. Not just about the issue, but about how to critique things, how to think critically. This process will actually teach critical thinking. Um, and so to implement this, it's technically simple. 
completely neutral to misinformation, so it doesn't fix sides, it doesn't decide anything, you have to trust it. Uh, for most critical thinking. Now, the difficulty to get there is, of course, getting the buy-in from Facebook and Google. That's the big issue, working on that. The algorithm to sort the critiques, there will be an armed race. People will try and spam it, people will try and game it. Not, so, not insolvable, just an issue, just a, an iterative issue you have to solve. Uh, and how do I allow voting from distributed in Texas? They are the three big issues that need to be solved and which happen over time. So, this brings me to the third section, and this is basically the last slide. The reason I am here is I'm working on this, I've got connections, I've been you know, working at the city, I've been at conferences, I know people, lots of these organizations. The question is, before I begin building it, what is the role of blockchain in this? Because I want to have this public, open source, um, trustless database. And blockchain has, you know, does that sort of thing. I just haven't yet, I don't understand the blockchain well enough to figure out whether the blockchain will help this or just be an unnecessary headache. So, um, either, I think, probably, in questions, ask me questions in general, but if anyone wants to help or participate or tell me some answers to this, I'll be around all night, come find me and, and let's talk. Uh, and then I'll take this. So, thank you all for listening. I am aware of Steam, I have not looked at the white paper for it yet, so that's not yet. What's the incentive for somebody to rebut something? Traffic. If you if you take the time to critique something, your objective is to, you know, if you, if you read an article that you go as nonsense, then you, it's, it hurts me when I read stuff that I know is convincing lots of people of bullshit. You know, like that vaccination thing. I know what's wrong with that study, it's completely, it's just completely bullcrap. But I know that people see that every day and believe it. Yeah, but you're a rational person. That's so. <laughs> 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 that's my motivation, right? If my motivation is if I take the time to critique it, you know that I want my critique in front of the people reading that article. Yeah. So there's a strong motivation. I think there might be a solution on the Steam blockchain, so it's worth checking out. Okay, cool. Yeah. And the second question is a bit related to uh, the reviewing algorithm. Um, for instance, some issues might be highly controversial. And it doesn't mean it's right or it's wrong. It's just like that some people are meant to react a lot because they might feel emotional about it. Like some, like I'm thinking of about maybe what happened in Charlottesville and stuff like this. Yeah. So, um, like for instance, um, if you're saying something that should be done in a way and you have a lot of opposers, you might have a lot of uh, uh, people commenting about it, and but actually it would be not um, um, rational comments. Yeah, right. So, the, oh sorry. Yeah, so yeah. that's how would you deal with this? Yeah, so the first question for everyone that couldn't hear it is we have a filter for trolling. Um, so, of course, uh, at this point in time, a lot of the nuanced control doesn't exist in Rupa. And of course, with the Socratic web side of things, say it still needs to be developed from scratch, people, everything I've learned from Rupa, but with consideration from Facebook and Google. So, a lot of these things will come out in those talks and in that work. Um, but in short, because of the, the, the way that it works, the structure is incredibly self-protective. Um, <coughs> there's one requirement for every single um, page in this list to that. There's one requirement that is just set in stone. It has to be critical of the first one. So if something's not critical, it gets tagged as spam. Um, if it's just nonsense, it gets tagged as spam. It has to meet this basic requirement. Um, and the other thing is, because we're doing URL level, it's not like somebody just go in and create an account and write a comment. So the, the time invested to create an article or a page is a threshold above the usual commenting system. Um, it's not flawless, and, and by no means you know, do I want to give that impression. This is a very blunt instrument. Um, it's you know, not no fine grained product. It's that way by design, because if you want to start like getting really high detailed and strict controls that the amount of information, the amount of issues, the amount of angles are just infinite and we won't get anywhere. So this is just by design intentionally simple. 
that data makes sense. That simple. That's all it is. So there's a lot of problems with that, but it allows people to act. It allows us to make progress. And then down the line, we then implement it. Then there'll be lots of room for, you know, like you guys are end the side chain sort of concept. You get this core done, and then people can start diving into the content on each page and pulling out data and then extrapolating on the arguments. Um, I think I've rambled off the question though. With regards to trolls and people sort of like um, intentionally getting inflaming, that will come down to the algorithm allowing, because in order to get a troll to argue to the top, you're going to have to brigade it. You're going to get a little bit of coming and voted up against what the public wants. And so this is no different to um, Google's constant arms race with SEO issues. There's no answer to it. It is an iterative process. So to that point, how do you then become less trusted? So just would you say with your algorithm, are you becoming as trusted or in the different away from? Yeah, so that is the one point of difficulty here. Um, so I've got a couple of thoughts on how to approach that. But this is also another thing about the blockchain. It's like, could the blockchain help in that issue of making it a trusted process by making it public in some way? If you make it public, does that make, mean you necessarily lose the arms race because people know what to target? So this is a very difficult question. But at the end of the day, if you have to have a private algorithmic update like Google does, it may be necessary. And so there'll be some element of trust in it. But at least one of the ways to sort of um, get around that is to allow, sort of to have three or four different algorithms or sort methods and let people choose which one they prefer themselves. <coughs> Just to conceptually, you had a question. You had the example of a black swan, black swan. The absence of black swans doesn't you know, mean to prove that they're all they're all white. So, just because I find a page that doesn't have a critique, doesn't mean it's correct. It could be right. that you, nobody's ranked it yet, nobody's read it, I haven't found it. So the absence of critique doesn't mean that it's correct. Absolutely. Um, so yeah. how do I find what's right? You don't find what's right. Hopefully by that point, if you come across the page that has no critique, at least you've read enough critiques or seen critiques often enough that you know that nothing's infallible, and you will have the capacity to go, I wonder why this isn't critiqued, and critique it yourself with some of the skills you've learned from other articles. And if anything, like one of the things that will come from this is, one of the problems with fake news is someone will like write an article in 30 seconds and then put it out there, and you can't debunk that sort of thing for hours or days. It takes time for you to notice it, and it takes time for you to research it, and it takes time to publish it. So one of the things that will happen is, fake news will, will go out there, we'll have no rebuttals against it for a day or two, but that will be probably more obvious because every page has rebuttals, and this page is so new it has no rebuttals, so it's like, well maybe I'll wait for a day or two before I look at it. So it can change the way we interact with information by that nature. Like when, when there's no rebuttals, it's like, it's a reason to pause. <coughs> One more. You were, yeah. You've yeah. had much exposure to the decentralized news network. In the States. No. <laughs> um, yeah. So they're on, they're on the fake news as well. Um, one of the elements. Is, well, is it a wiki? Is it not Jimmy? I don't think it's a wiki. I think it's their. their That's wiki tribute. Yeah, they're rewarding, yeah, yeah, they're rewarding uh, voters, if you like, with coin or part of coin yeah. for being part of it. Um, it's not that well advanced yet, but there's some people, you want to just have a check that out. Yeah. Sort of Actually, now I think, I think I have heard of a blockchain decentralized network, but I haven't been doing it at all, so. Decentralized news network. Okay, thanks. Um, as I said, we're out of time. I'll stick around, come ask some questions. I'll go to the back now if anyone wants to be now, but I'll be around on that. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you.